You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, episode number 90. The strongest human emotion is fear. It's the essence of any good thriller that, for a little while, you believe in the boogeyman. John Carpenter. Broadcasting from a dark, windowless room in Hollywood, when we really should be working on that next draft, it's the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, showing you the craft and business of screenwriting while teaching you how to make your screenplay bulletproof. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Bulletproof Script Coverage. Now, unlike other script coverage services, Bulletproof Script Coverage actually focuses on the kind of project you are and the goals of the project you are. So we actually break it down by three categories, micro-budget, indie film market, and studio film. There's no reason to get coverage from a reader that's used to reading tentpole movies when your movie's going to be done for $100,000. And we wanted to focus on that at Bulletproof Script Coverage. Our readers have worked with Marvel Studios, CAA, WME, NBC, HBO, Disney, Scott Free, Warner Brothers, The Blacklist, and many, many more. So if you need your screenplay or TV script covered by professional readers, head on over to CoverMyScreenplay.com. Now, welcome to this year's Halloween episode of the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, and I have an amazing guest for you today. And before we get started, I wanted to let you know that we have just added three amazing screenwriters to our screenplay collection at Bulletproof Screenwriting for you guys to read and educate yourselves on the craft. And this month, we have George Romero, the creator of Night of the Living Dead, the legendary John Carpenter, and next week, we'll be releasing the master of horror himself, Wes Craven's screenplay collection of all of his films. And included in that post will be a bonus section of all of the Scream film screenplays as well. So if you want to read these guys, just head over to bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash screenplays. Now, today on the show, we have screenwriter and director Jeffrey Riddick, who is the creator of one of the most successful horror franchises in history, Final Destination. All five Final Destination films have grossed over $650 million worldwide. And the story of how Jeffrey actually came up with the concept for Final Destination and how he got from his idea all the way to New Line Cinema and how it finally got produced is an amazing and inspirational story. I love talking to Jeffrey. I've been trying to get Jeffrey on the show for a while because he's a busy, busy man, but we finally got him. And we also talk about his new film, Don't Look Back, which is his directorial debut, and people seem to love it. I had a ball talking to Jeffrey, so without any further ado, please enjoy my spooky conversation with Jeffrey Riddick. I'd like to welcome to the show the legendary Jeffrey Riddick. How are you doing, Jeffrey? I'm doing well. How you doing, brother? <laughs> I'm good, man. I'm good, man. It's uh, as good as we can be in this yeah. horror script of a year. <laughs> I know. I know. It's just like when you think you hit the final act and the no. killer's dead, the killer pops back up again. And it's like, uh I mean, like I was talking to another guest the other day about is like, this is so on the nose. Like you, no studio would produce the script of 2020. It's just too, it doesn't even make sense. <laughs> doesn't make sense yeah absolutely no it's been it, it has been like you know you try to stay, stay grateful and you try to stay positive about stuff but you can't not take in the fact that like the world is like suffering through something really absolutely right now, absolutely know? and getting um, and getting crazier and get it, it is. and getting crazier but yeah. but we as filmmakers and screenwriters are insane enough to go yes i know the world is burning but how do I get my, my screenplay produced? How do I, <laughs> I need the budget for my film. We can still make this movie. We can do it safely. <laughs> that's, that's the insanity of the, of the psychosis of a filmmaker or screenwriters. You're just like, how do I get this movie made in this craziness? Is yeah. that, I, I, I imagine they're filmmakers in the Mad Max world and going, I know we have no gasoline. 
or yeah. cameras, but we got to shoot something. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking about starting an OnlyFans page, um, not not doing the stuff that they normally do on there, but just only just me typing, you know, <laughs> just somebody. So I'm sure there's some people out there that will be like, oh, that's so relaxing to watch Jeffrey type all day. <laughs> just pay me a couple of bucks a month and, I'll, and you could just you watch, watch me type. Exactly. Watch me type. <laughs> it's the it's the new generation of the burning log or the fish tank video. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jeffrey, how did you get into the business? Um. It, how I have, how I got into the business is, is a pretty funny story. Um, it all started when I was fourteen, um, and I was a you know fourteen year old hillbilly living in Eastern Kentucky. Um, and I saw this movie, A Nightmare on Elm Street, that blew my mind. It's still my favorite movie ever. And um, I went home and I banged out a prequel on my little typewriter, and I found out who owned New Line Cinema, who ran New Line Cinema, Bob Shea, and I got the address and I mailed it to him. And he sent it back to me and he's like, you know, we don't take unsolicited material. Uh, thanks for sending your thing. So I had to look up unsolicited because you know, I'm 14. I didn't know what that meant. And then I wrote him back. I sent it back to him because I was kind of perturbed. I was like, look, sir, I've seen three of your movies and I spent three dollars on your work. So I think you can take five minutes to read my story. And he actually read it. <laughs> but this is what, so what year is this? So we're talking like 80. This was 85. So this is the time that you could actually call up Bob Shea's office, get a receptionist or get her, his assistant and actually maybe possibly get through. Well, I didn't get through to him on the phone, but I got, okay. yeah, I got the, but even get through to him, then, period. <laughs> yeah, I didn't, but, I, but then I wrote the letter and, and, you know, once I wrote that second letter, he wrote me back and he's like, thank you for your aggressive introduction. <laughs> and um, he read the story and he was very constructive and, Basically, his assistant, Joy Mann, who was a, a wonderful woman. She's not with us any longer. Mm -hmm. um, she, her and Bob kind of took me under their wing from afar. And so they would send me scripts and movie posters oh and God. just things that, you know, a 14-year-old kid in Kentucky, like, flips out over. And um, they stayed in touch with me until um, I was 19. And I went to college in Kentucky at this great uh, college called uh, Berea College. And I went to New York for a study, uh, for a summer program to study acting and. Bob and Joy said, well, hey, do you want to intern at New Line? I'm like, are you kidding me? Of course I do. And um, I got an agent and decided to stay in New York. And, you know, my internship turned into a position at New Line. And I ended up working there for 11 years. And they ended up, you know, producing Final Destination. So um, that little thing. Yeah, that little that little film that you uh, <laughs> yeah. little, little, little something. I, I, I like the way you just dropped that in there. Yeah, they just produced the Final Destination. Um, well, it one of the more successful horror franchises in, in history. Um, now, how did you get – well, first of all, how did you come up with the idea for Final Destination? The uh, the kernel for the idea came when I was um, I was flying home to – a lot of stuff was is Kentucky-based. I was flying home to Kentucky, and I read an article about a woman who was on vacation, and her mother called her and said, don't take the flight you're on tomorrow. I have a bad feeling about it. And so she changed flights, and in the story, they said the flights that she was supposed to be on crashed. So that – put the idea in my head, but I didn't know the story to go with the idea. And then, you know, years later I was um, trying to get an agent for, for writing. And so I had to write a spec script for something that was on TV and I loved the X-Files. So I used that idea as a setup for an X-Files episode and I got the agent and then my friends at New Line were like, this is a great idea. Like, don't, you know, don't send the script in like for an X-Files episode, like make it a feature. So I ended up writing a treatment you know, because back in the day, you could sell treatments <laughs> for for projects, right. you know, or so a pitch like, right. or a pitch. Yeah, you could do that back then. And now it's like, hey, pitch us the story and tell us who your A-list star is. <laughs> so, and do you have and do you have 50 percent of the financing in place already and yeah. you have distribution in place. already? <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, the business is, is, <laughs> is changed so much. But um, but, you know, I one of my friends, Chris Bender, that worked at New Line had just started working for uh, Craig Perry and Warren Zide. Um, who were producers that had a deal at New Line. And I knew that even though I worked at New Line and I had a straight kind of pipeline to the creative team, I knew that it would give me more juice if I had producers on board because they would just take it more seriously. Um, but it was a hard, honestly, it was a hard sell. Like they were like, we don't get death being the killer. Like you can't see it. You can't fight it. And we're like, that's the point. Um, and so it wasn't until we threatened to take it to Miramax. They were like, we'll buy it. <laughs> <laughs> So, all right, we'll buy it. And we'll take a chance on it. And, uh, um, 
No, it's a and great, it's a, stuff. it's a great idea. It is such a, a, you know, and you're, and you're right. I can only imagine back then because it was like, you had Jason, you had Freddie, you had Michael Myers, you had Chucky and all these, like, you could put that on the poster. You can't yeah. put death <laughs> that has no figure <laughs> on, yeah. the, on the poster. So it must be, a, it must have been a difficult sell for the marketing team. It, it was. And I think they did a great job with it. Oh, and, um, yeah. But, you know, the whole reason that we, we, you know, the whole reason that I, I want, and I'm glad that when James Wong and Glenn Morgan came on, they fought to make sure that that, that death never had a form. And they came up with some, some other amazing thing, like the whole Rube Goldberg aspect of it. But the reason that I wanted right. to not give death a form is because I wanted it to be as universal as possible. And if you put like, if you put like a Western kind of Christian version of death, you know, like Grim Reaper with the sickle or something like that, then, then it, doesn't appeal to people who either are have different religious beliefs or spiritual yeah, beliefs smart. or don't have spiritual beliefs. So I thought it was very important to not do that. And and I think that's why it's been as su- successful as, as it has been. Yeah. It travels very well around the yeah. world because everybody has death in their culture. That is something yeah. that concept is in every culture. The figure of it is different from culture to culture. Right. Um, but so that's it. People a, can, maybe can project, they can project their own, version of what death is onto the movie which is fantastic and i remember the trailers of that film they just and and as the sequels kept coming they kept focusing more and more on the deaths like that was like that was the selling point like what is the craziest way we could kill somebody yes (laughs) and that and that became the uh the hook i guess as as these kept going how many there was five right yeah, there have been five of them, and, and there will be a sixth one. Um, there, it was definitely in the works before COVID hit, and now COVID's just kind of put the brakes. Are they are they going are they going to kind of reboot the whole thing, or are they going to just make it a, a straight up sequel? Or you don't know, you can't tell. Uh, I don't. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't. I don't know if reboot. I think reboot is too strong of a word. Um, mm-hmm. You know, because it's the Final Destination. You know, films have their formula. You know. A, a, big set piece at the beginning and then death comes after people. Um, so I, I don't know if reboot's the right word because that, mm-hmm. that intimate, but bring a new generation, I guess. I mean, but every, every, but every, but every cast was like, you didn't have one cast member that ran through the whole thing. Did you? I don't remember. Uh, Tony Todd is the, is, the, is the recurring, re, has been the recurring character and Ali Larder was in the, the right. first and second one. But yeah. Tony Todd's been, you know, he hasn't been in every single one of them, but he's been in like a lot of, yeah. You know, it, yeah, he should be in every one of them. But, right. <laughs> um, there were a few where they didn't put him in there, and and they 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 got they got the message that people love Tony Todd and Final Destination. Now I, I do remember we you and I originally met ten years ago on a panel here in L.A. a horror film panel, and um, I remember you saying on the panel they're like, look, I, I they can make as many of these as they want because every single time they make one, I get a check. So <laughs> yeah, I know. Residuals. I, sounds, residuals. No, yeah, but that sounds like good. Yeah, yeah, that sounds better on a panel. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there aren't many people there. Then I sound like a douchebag. No, no, but, but, but it, no, and I don't mean to make. I don't mean to make you sound like that. I completely, and I no, mean I'm that. And uh, listen, I look. I I know a lot of. Uh, I've had a lot of screenwriters on board that like they work on a few of the first ones, and then I had the guy who did um, Air Bud, who created Air Bud. Oh, yeah. And they made 12 of those films. He was o- only involved in the first two or three, but every single time they make a new one, he gets a residual check. So that's nothing to be ashamed of as a screenwriter. Well, it's, and I, I know. And it, well, even as a horror fan, though, it's like I, I want there to – yes, the money is nice. But I want there to be more because I can't think of any other franchise that's been this successful and they've only made five of them in 20 years. Like yeah, every that's other – there have been like – 20 Halloweens and 20 Friday, you know, there've been like, even, you know, even Nightmare on Elm Street, there's been like, it's like, come on, make some more. Cause the fans want it. And I, I need to get some new shoes. <laughs> <laughs> As we were saying, residual checks are nice. They're very, yeah. very nice. Yeah. Um, now how did, I want to, I always like to ask this of, of a screenwriter who has a hit because when final destination came out, it was a, a fairly large hit for, for for the it was a fairly small budget too. I'm imagine uh, it wasn't a huge budget. No, that was a, that one. I have to say that it was 20 million, which is actually big for a horror movie big, back then. Big for a horror film, um, but yeah, it was a it was a big hit. Um, 
It how was did, a sleeper hit because it opened at like number three or four, and then the next week it went up, and then the next week it went up to number one. So it was definitely a word of mouth hit too, which was nice to see happen. And that rarely ever happens, especially with horror. Yeah, usually they open big and then they drop. Right, exactly. Quickly. So I always like to ask um, screenwriters who had that kind of success: How did the tra- the town treat you? What was the experience of being in the final destination uh, hurricane, if you will? Well, the funny thing is I, I missed the hurricane because I was in New York. So I worked out of the New York office of New Line. Mm-hmm. So I wasn't in L.A. where kind of all the, you know, the hurricane-like action happens. So I was, I was aware of how well it did, but I was in a different world. Mm-hmm. And so I stayed at New Line because I, I just love the company so much. I'm just one of those people that, you know, creatures of habit that gets very comfortable. I actually stayed at New Line until I sold the sequel, the story for the sequel in 2000, in 2000. And then finally my bosses were like, you know, and everybody at New Line was like, we love you to death, Jeffrey, but you, you sold two movies now. It's time it's, to, it's time to move. Do it, do, it, do it for real. Go out into um, the world, Jeffrey. It's okay. <laughs> like they were pushing you out of the nest, <laughs> out of the nest. And, um, but I, I was happy in New York, so I was going to stay in New York, but unfortunately, you know, nine eleven happened, and I lived um, in Battery Park City, which is not far from the World Trade Center. So right. once that happened, I then I decided to move out to LA. So, you know, typically when something like that happens, even when you sell a project, you kind of, you know, looking back, you kind of, you know, you move to LA immediately, you milk that movie as much as you can till it comes out, and if it's a hit, you're out here. But I kind of missed all all of that stuff. So by the mm-hmm. time I got out here, it was funny because. Um, People, my agent, you know, I got an agent and he pretty much had to introduce me to the town because, um, you know, James Wong and Lynn Morgan, who, you know, co-wrote the movie and also directed it, you know, they were out here in the hurricane. Mm-hmm. So people didn't really know who I was until I actually got out here. And then they read my script and they're like, oh, I'm like, well, my name's all over the poster. <laughs> but they don't, you know, it's, it's a town where if you're not sitting in a room with somebody, they don't actually go and look at a movie poster in the credits. Like, they just I- kind of go away. Yeah, out of sight, out of mind, basically. Out of sight, out of mind. So, um, so I missed the craziness of the hurricane, which I think was probably a good thing um, for me, just as a person, because I think if I had got out here, I, I, I may have got sucked into like just a world of craziness that I wasn't prepared for. I I got sober like 15 years ago, so I I think um, if you know, and and mine was my my vice was was drinking, and it was you know just wasn't anything like super crazy. It was just kind of more like sitting at home being a a sad drunk (laughs) and not being happy. So I think if I'd have been out here in that celebratory party kind of scene, it wouldn't have been healthy. I think I, it would have been very unhealthy for me. So I think it was a, it was probably, you know, God looking out for me in that, that, that way. But, um, it's funny now kind of, you know, as the years go by though, seeing how, much of an impact the movie has had like you know when i hear somebody say this is a final destination moment like oh, yeah. even when i'm not around like they don't know that i'm involved with it at all i'll just be out in public and somebody's like oh it's like final destination and it's like holy shit like this is like part of the culture now like oh it's in know, the it's, it's in the zeitgeist of, of yeah, yeah it, it's it's definitely transcended like i mean i'd argue kind of like a freddy or a jason or a chucky or a michael but in its own its own very unique space i mean you have a final destination is a very unique niche within the horror genre because there is no killer yes yeah. visual killer it's a very you know a very very unique um and that has more than one movie it has five yeah. movies, you know, so um, that it's in itself. And I guess they kept being successful because they kept making them. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, and it's, you know, it's it's just as a, somebody who's been a horror fan my whole life. It's been it's been very gratifying, you know, it's but it's also a dragon that you're chasing. You know, you find yourself chasing <laughs> that, dra- that dragon where somebody's like, well, why don't you bring us something like Final Destination again? Uh, and I'm like, well, here's this idea. And they're like, oh, that's too much like Final Destination. Well, that was not enough like Final Destination. So that is something that is something that's real because a lot of filmmakers uh, and screenwriters don't realize that. But when you're you're a hit in town for something, that's the box you get put into, and you a lot of times have to fight your way out of that box. I know I know uh, for a fact that Wes Craven, one of the greatest horror directors of all time, 
um, I, I knew his personal assistant that was his personal assistant for many years and he was dying to get out of, he wanted to do something different. He'd been doing yep. horror for such a long time. And that movie, um, music of the heart, which was called 500 yep. violins. The only reason he got that was because they wanted scream Two. He's like, well, if you want me to do scream Two, Harvey, I need, give me the budget to make, yeah. to make this. Um, and that's how he got it. But he was, I felt that he was from what I understood, he was frustrated that he was only able to do horror. I know he wanted to venture out as an artist. Um, yeah. And that happens, doesn't it? Yeah. They, it's, 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 and it, since I love horror, it's, I don't mind being in that box as far as sure. writing goes, but yeah, the idea that it's like, we, we need you to bring us something like final destination, that unique thing that you created. But then we didn't actually, we were very concerned about it because it was unique until it became a hit. It's just a hard place to be in. But, you know, I, I've, the good thing is I find myself like branching out a little bit. Like right now I'm working on two animated series for the car or for Netflix. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and they're, they're, they're kid animated series. Um, and one of them has some creepy fairy tale, dark fairy tale elements. And the other one's like, um, a spinoff of Usagi Yojimbo, the Japanese comic book. Sure. So that's like samurai rabbits, you know, and it's so much fun to do it. So I'm, I'm finding myself finally branching out a little bit but i always will will come back to genre like i i love the genre so much that well if you love it you love it but you but you also want to break out from look i don't want to write another final destination i did that let's yeah. let's move yeah, on let's, let's do something else <laughs> now were you involved with the sequels uh, i know you were involved with the second sequel did you were you involved with the other sequels at all uh not not fi- not physically involved i mean i i'm very good friends with the producer craig perry so you know, he'll call me up and a lot of times and bounce ideas off of me and let me know what's going on. So I, I definitely kind of know what's going on with the, the franchise. And it's it's actually been fun to see other people kind of come in and put their their mark on the, the brand. I mean, the first one, it, it's always been this almost incestuous circle with the first four. It's like, you know, I worked on the first one and the second one. James Wong and Glenn Morgan worked on the first one and the third one. Eric Bress and J. Mackie Gruber worked on the second one. And then Eric Bress did the fourth one. And then we brought in somebody do for the fifth one. And it was, you know, I, I love the fifth one. Um, but it's, it's just fun to see like other people kind of come in and take that concept and put their spin on it. Right. I'm imagining what the George Lucas feels like with, uh, what they've been doing with Mandalorian and, and all the other cool, um, films and stuff that they're doing with his, his baby that he had put out so many years ago. Yeah. Uh, I think it all depends probably on personalities. Like if, um, I, like I'm not sure, like because I know some people get very protective and precious of of their work, but it, you know I think that's part of working at a studio what, that helped me kind of separate my ego from a lot of that stuff because I I realize like you know once you write a movie and somebody else buys it, you're kind of handing it over to other right. people, so you just hope to create a good enough relationship with those people that you can have some say in how they execute it. Um, but again, it's a quality problem. To, it's a quality problem to have if, if you have other people doing sequels to your stuff. So I, I definitely don't complain about. <laughs> right, it's a first world problems, as they say. It's first world problems. Um, now you are such a fan and a student of the genre of horror films. What makes a good horror screenplay? I mean, I think for me, it it all, it starts with the basics of you know having relatable characters. Um, I think if if you make me fall in love with these characters and care about them, then I will follow the journey wherever it takes me. Um, sometimes it, scripts go off into bizarre directions, but if it's grounded in characters that I can really relate to and care about, um, that's always the most important thing for me. Um, I do think, you know, for for horror, you know, you want to, you know, you want to have some kind of hook that can bring people into the story, some kind of concept that doesn't feel like we're reading the same story of, you know, a family moves into a house and, you know, something horrible happened there. And now a ghost is like haunting them. It's like, we've seen that so many times. It's like, you, you do want something that we haven't seen a hundred times, unless you're putting a very unique spin on it. Um, scares and suspense are obviously important. Um, and if you're doing a straight up horror film, obviously the, the kills and the set pieces are important too. Um, if you're doing a movie, um, because you, you, you're also you're writing something for for people, but you're making it for an audience out there. So there are certain things that the audience expects in a horror film. So you either want to deliver on th- those expectations or subvert them in a cool way. Uh, so 
Very cool. Now, what are the biggest problems you see with horror protagonists? Because, you know, it's almost a cliche. You're like, why are you doing, like, you're yelling at the screen, don't go in there. The killer's in there. Like, what is the biggest problem you see with protagonists in horror films in general? Um, I think that you pretty much hit it on the head. I mean, I think a lot of movies require, and, you know, and I'm sure, like, there there are movies that I've written where this happens too, but, you know, when you require, because the thing is, audiences, I, I read this somewhere where a psychologist said that, that film audiences always think that they're braver and smarter than the people on screen. So like, you know, when a character wouldn't do something in the film there, and the audience are like, well, if I was there, I'd have jumped on that killer's back and done it. But the the worst thing you can do is have like, and I've seen so many good movies just get undermined by this, where they just have the main characters stay in a location when any rational person right. would have left. Um, and do stupid things that any rational person wouldn't do. So if you have a character that keeps making bad choices just to keep the story going, that's the biggest mistake I see. I'll, I'll, I've read so many scripts where it's like, you know, this isn't even this isn't even this isn't even movie talking. This is like a human being. Like I cannot think of any person, no matter how tough they are, that would stay here after what they just saw. Right. You know, like you know, I I read a script recently where you know a person gets invited to like some mysterious party and doesn't know who invited them and walks in and there's like some weird orgy going on. And, you know, she backs up into some strange guy and he's like, Oh, don't worry about that. Follow me. I'll show you what's where the host is. And I'm like, (laughs) person would be gone at that point. You know, she's, she was horrified by the orgy. It wasn't like she saw the orgy and was like, Hmm, that looks fun. She was like horrified by it. And so who's going to follow some strange man, you know, so when I see stuff like when I read stuff like that in scripts, um, especially when that happens over and over again, um, I think that's the biggest mistake I see in horror films is making your characters continually do s- silly things just to keep the story going. Well, when I when I was thinking uh, thinking of three films specifically that are horror films that are so good that they transcend the, the genre almost, which is Jaws, Exorcist, and Silence of the Lambs. Yeah. the stories, the characters, everything is so well constructed. There's never a moment in silence of the lambs. I'm just like, don't, don't like, why are you doing that? Like jaws yeah. is, is perfectly, it's, a, it's as perfect of a, a film. It's period. Um, as you can get. Um, and the exorcist, like those, the situation is structured in a way where, well, the priest is trying to get the devil out of this girl. So he has to be in there. Because yes. that's his job, as opposed to, you know, oh, oh uh, let's hey, let's all split up in the woods, <laughs> yeah, so the killer can knock us off one at a time, right? And you don't get a pass because I see a lot of this in the scripts too, where people will be like, "Really? Now you want to split up? Now have you seen a horror movie?" And then they still split up. It's like that doesn't give you a pass by acknowledging. <laughs> exactly. Now, well, and that was the perfect thing. Well, that started with Scream. When Scream actually was so self-aware of of its own faults, yeah, I mean that is a brilliant script, and that's a brilliant yeah, I love Scream. I that's one of my favorites. I mean, it's yeah. so brilliantly done, and the first opening sequence oh, with Drew Barrymore. I mean, it's it's the psycho. And you, you you're it's killing. Brilliant. I, yeah, it's, I mean, spoiler alert: first ten minutes, Drew Drew dies. Um, <laughs> but but it like it was shocking for a new generation. It was basically what what Psycho did. Back in the yeah. day, but it was so brilliant. I remember when that came out; it was just like a, a revelation. Like everybody, it was a, such a monster hit at the time. Well, it's funny because I went to a screening of it, and I didn't. I, you know, I saw the poster in the trailer. I thought Drew Barrymore was the star of it. So I just went in there with my sweet ass, going, "Well, I can't wait to watch Drew, Drew scream for like ninety minutes and get." And I was like, "What? <laughs> what? What's going on?" You no, know, it's like one of the most brilliant ten minutes of cinema. Yeah, it's yeah. it's it's amazing. Now, w- with the we know what the problem is with protagonists, but what can you do as a screenwriter to make a horror villain legendary? Because we've already rattled off a handful of names that are all you need to do is just say their first names, and in the horror yeah. genre, they know what it is. So, what do you do? Like, what makes Michael Myers, Freddy, Jason, um, you know, those characters so? so legendary as opposed to other horror, you know, other horror, either franchises that either come and go um, that have 
those kind of it looks from the poster the same elements as Jason or Freddy, but they don't live up to it. And they don't. What's that magic? What's that thing? In your opinion, you know what I think? I I don't think that there's. I don't think that that that's almost an answer because it's it's almost like catching lightning in a bottle. Mm-hmm. Um, because sometimes the characters are so like you mentioned, Sons of Lamb, like Hannibal Lecter is such a delectable, like you know, with its with just the, the portrayal and the way that he was filmed and everything is that it's mesmerizing. That so you have sometimes you have villains like that or Freddy Krueger. I think is probably the best example of the of the slashers um, because especially in the first movie, like he was so feral and so there was just something so wicked about him. Like he cut himself, he cut at people. He was just horrible. Like we'd never seen anything like that. And Chucky too had such a distinct, you know, it's a toy, you know, it's like, it looked like a little toy. You know, you almost had as much fun with the Chucky movies when the dolls getting knocked around knowing that, <laughs> knowing that it's possessed. Like, so it's, <laughs> there's something about that, but, you know, I think, you know, with Michael Myers, he didn't say anything and it was just, he was this embodiment of evil, but also that movie came out at a time, you know, we were kind of in, you know, the suburbs, everything was about the sub suburbs and how the suburbs were safe and the last bastion of safety in America. And, you know, Michael Myers came in and kind of took that over. Um, and with Friday the 13th, you know, like people forget, you know, Jason's mother was a killer in the first one. And he wore like a sack over his head in the second one. Um, he didn't get the hockey mask on the third one. And I think that that, that by that point, it you just where our culture was at the time, slashers are so hot. And that just happened to be the one that like exploded Friday the 13th exploded. Um, I don't know if it was necessarily because of Jason per se. Timing. Um, it was timing. I think it was timing on that one. Because again, most people think of him with the hockey mask. And it's like, well, he didn't have the hockey mask till the third movie and he wasn't the killer in the first one. Um, so I think timing has a lot to do with when certain movies take off and when certain movies hit. But I think – Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, but I, I think when you create a, a villain for a horror film, especially if it's like a slasher film, um, you do kind of want to come up with some kind of iconography, some kind of look that's unique where people will like re- – they'll remember that, that, that killer if your movie's fortunate enough to like really strike a chord with people and take off. Like that sucks about Final Destination. It's like – we could have had a Halloween costume and a toy line, but we don't because it's we don't have a killer. So, <laughs> <laughs> but we have five. But we have five movies, and hopefully a six yeah, coming. No, I love the movies, but it's funny because it's like, yeah, I because I, I love like collecting like you know statues, right. you know movie po- posters and statues and tchotchkes. So it'd be nice to. It's like. Eh. Can't have one for mine, but that's all right. <laughs> they should. They should actually sell the statues of the kills. So. <laughs> <laughs> like the oh, that, that, uh, the sequence of a kill, <laughs> like that's that, your... that would be awesome. Like the log going in the sheriff's car, <laughs> right? Exactly, the all those kills. The B on the balance beam in the fifth one, like I love that kill too. Yeah, um, but but you look at things like Leprechaun, and I'm like, how did that thing become a? How did that become a thing? Like they ran off. Like how many of those are there? They, they just took off. So and then something like Candyman did it. Like, there should be 20 Candymen. <laughs> yeah, there should be. I mean, well, you know what's interesting, too, is um, we have to also look at the time when these movies came out as far as what was accessible. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, back when, when I was young, you know, there were, like, three networks in HBO. So everybody was watching the same things. And so people were seeing the same movies. There weren't as many movies that were coming out as there are now. So, you know, you didn't have a, you know, when scary movies came out, like, everybody rushed to see them. But everybody across the country was seeing like the same movies and watching the same things on television. You know, like back in the day, it was like 60 million, you know, viewers was like a hit for a network show. And now it's like, well, we got 10 million viewers. It's a hit. So, you know, the the country used to be much more. The choices used to be a lot more limited. So a lot of the people would get around, especially the horror fans with with reading Fangoria. You know, you'd, you'd see what was coming up in Fangoria and then all the horror fans would rush out and see those movies. Um and they're, you know, they're cheaper to make and they turn a profit. So um, I think that's why you have a lot of horror franchises. You know, they seem to have burned themselves out a, a while ago uh, just because I think the marketplaces got bigger with like the streamers um, and so many theater chains now with so many movies coming out. Like it's you really have to like rise above all the clutter out there. Right. Um, and and like Candyman's being I think it's in the can already. The Jordan Peele remake yeah, of Candyman. Yeah, it's going to come out. But they, they had to push it. But, you know, Candyman's one of those movies. I mean, 
it's it's it definitely appears in like the top rated you know as far right. as it, it's a it's a beautiful movie um but i i do think you know people you know i don't i like to say it delicately because people get their hackles up when when you start talking about race at all mm-hmm. but you know yeah. you have to look at the time when that movie came out right and you know it's basically an interracial love story and you know people weren't quite ready for that i mean i just read in 85 you know there was there was when they put out Commando, um, there was a love scene between Arnold Schwarzenegger's character and the female lead. But when they cast Radon Chong, they cut this love scene out because they're like, ah, the country's not ready for this yet. And there was there was still a lot of that, I think, ickiness that people had about interracial relationships. And I'm like, screw you, because if it wasn't for interracial relationships, I wouldn't be here. So right. um, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. But but. You know, it was a different time back then. So I, you know, but I mean, that movie's from the acting, directing. Yeah, I remember it. I mean, everything is like, it's a, I mean, it's a masterful movie. Like you, such a beautiful movie. And I thought the sequel was good too. I like, I like the sequel a lot, but yeah, it did. I think the reason it probably didn't take off is it was, it was, it was, it wasn't the, you know, hot teenagers getting slashed up, you know, it was like dealing with like, you know, racial inequality and racial injustice. And it also had an interracial love story at the center of it. So I think people, you know, I, again, I just think people weren't quite ready for that at the time that it came out. So how do you see from, from the moment that final destination was released to now and moving forward, how has horror changed? Because I don't see as many slasher films anymore. That's not as in vogue as it used to be. Um, right. You know, it, it's not like the eighties, the golden, the golden, era of of slasher films and that kind of horror what kind yeah. of, and then there was the um was it uh horror porn or not horror porn but um oh, saw saw torture. Torture. yeah torture yeah, porn. yeah the the, the yeah. saw and the hostel and that that whole era of of kind of horror where do you see horror going and it, are we going to come back to some of this you know nostalgic slasher because i know they tried to remake freddy and they did they did as good of a job but you can't catch that Robert England is Freddie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think right now we're, we're very much in a supernatural kind of, right. you know, conjuring kind of horror kind of world. Um, but, but I honestly, you know, cause I, I know that the business tries to, the business tries to stay ahead of the curve and kind of run the ball about what's going to be popular, but then something popular comes out and then they, everybody tries to start making that. So everybody's, you know, trying to make the next get out now, like socially relevant kind of horror films. Um, so I think we'll be seeing some more of that coming out for a while, but I think we're just one, you know, fresh slasher film away from having any of these genres come back. I mean, I still love a good slasher movie. Um, you know, I, I, you know, there've been a glut of zombie movies like, you know, and I, I get on Netflix and Amazon prime and Hulu and everything. I'm like, you know, from every country, it's like there's a gazillion zombie movies out there right now. Right. Um, so I don't know. I, I mean, I think people go to see horror films to escape the horrors going on in the real world. So I feel like escapism horror, like supernatural kind of stuff, is probably going to always be popular um, in slasher stuff because that's still escapism if it's not sadistic, you know, like just mean spirited. Mm-hmm. Um, I certainly know when COVID first hit, you know, all my friends were like, we're writing a COVID script. I'm like, don't. don't no, no. <laughs> I said the same thing. I'm like, I had, I, had to, I talked to some executives like we got 20 COVID scripts a day and nobody is going to produce a COVID script because the last thing I want to watch is a COVID script. <laughs> yeah. Like you didn't want to watch a 9-11 movie after 9-11 or a Vietnam movie while Vietnam was going on. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that, um, I think the escapism horror, you know, I think supernatural still goes strong for a long time, but you know, I think slasher movies are always going to be popular. It's just, you gotta, you know, you gotta get that right slasher kind of combination with characters and in, in the slasher together. And, and, that, and that's the one thing I love. You said, said something a, a second ago, mean spirited with uh, those, those slasher films of the eighties that we all kind of love and grew up with. They're not mean spirited. I mean, yeah. Freddie is funny. Like he got funnier. Yeah. He got a lot funnier after sec- yeah. the second and third and fourth. He became almost a comedy act, <laughs> you know, yeah. killing people towards the end and towards the end of th- th- that series. 
And, and, you know, it wasn't mean spirited. Even Michael and, and those, and Jason, who are kind of basically voiceless and don't say anything. Um, and yeah. when Freddie versus Jason came out, I mean, that was hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> that was yeah. so much fun. But uh, that is a key, isn't it? Not being mean spirited in the way you do it. And I, I think a lot of those torture, um, kind of torture porn films kind of, I think a little bit were a little bit mean spirited. Like Saw 1 was amazing. Yeah. And I think that's a, you know, it's all a personal, it's a matter of taste for sure. Like I don't, you know, cause I know certain people like certain types of movies, but I sure. think that there's, there's a difference like, and I'll just use hostile as an example. Like I thought the first hostile was very entertaining. Like it, it had, it had humor to it. Um, you had, you know, male, um, antagonists for the first time in a, in a long time in horror movies. Um, so, and it was also kind of commenting on how like, you know, you know, American men will, American anybody will travel internationally and they're just, we have an arrogance about us. Like we, you know, we go to like France and we're like annoyed that people don't speak English. And then, but we're here demanding that everybody speak English. But when we travel, we're like, why doesn't anybody speak English everywhere? So it kind of played up that whole thing and made the character, you know, the characters were kind of, some of them were sympathetic, but some of them were kind of jerks and the torture didn't come till later. Whereas I think if you watch Saw 2, you know, in my humble opinion, like it, it kind of did everything right that Hostel did, I think Hostel 2 did wrong, you know, because it had, you know, women, it had the, you know, Heather Mazzazoa's character who's like tied up naked, hung upside down, like begging for her life as this woman like slowly like slices her for, you know, it's just, there's a difference in tone, like there's a, yeah, there's just a mean spiritedness about like Hostel 2 and there's a mean spiritedness about certain of these kind of torture porn movies where it's, you're not just, you know, because you want to go have fun at these movies. It's not like, right. it's not like watching a, you don't want to go and watch somebody, you know, you don't want to watch a mortician dissect a, a body. Correct. In real life. So for a horror movie, it's not like you want to sit there and watch a killer slowly, like t- torture a person to death. You know, it's like watching it, somebody torture a cat on, you know, online. It's like, that's not entertaining. Um, that just feels gratuitous and this mean spirited. And I think that that's why those films don't tend to, have as big of an audience because even the Saw movies, they're they're not. I don't feel like they're mean spirited. There's a there's a sense of like with Jigsaw, you know, giving people a choice to like save themselves or save somebody else. Um, you know, sometimes yeah, I, I don't feel like they're you know they're gruesome, but I don't feel like they're mean. Like it feels like you're like I remember like, Hostel being like Hostel was uh, Hostel two specifically was. I agree with you was mean. Yeah, you know, like there, there was just like I don't want to watch this. Like this is. Yeah. Then you watch Freddy, and you're like, well, this is fun. Like yeah. you know, it, this is this is just fun. Chucky is, you it's know, fun. like when when my, when my wife saw Chucky the first time, she's like, and she watched it years later after it was released. She's like, this is ridiculous. I would just kick the damn thing. It's a doll. Like <laughs> it's so it's a doll. What's wrong with yeah. you people? Like it's like, but that's kind of what makes it funny, and that he's yeah. so wonderfully written, and and his dialogue oh, yeah. and everything is so, yeah. and, and the bride of Chucky and all of that oh, stuff. I that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. Um, now, what do you feel? Because uh, you've I'm sure read a lot of scripts in your day. What is the biggest mistake you see young screenwriters make? Um. I don't know if this is a, a a quantitative like if this is a like a, a literal mistake I can say I, I I think the the problem that I find with a lot of young screenwriters is they think they're great writers with their first script right right away yeah and and any and in any you know just if you think logically no matter what if you're no matter what you're if you're an artist whether you're a painter a writer a singer you get better with practice and the more you do it. And if you're a craftsman, if you make stuff out of wood, you get better. Like the first thing that you carve out of wood isn't going to be the best thing that's ever been carved out of wood before. So I think the biggest mistake that I see with a lot of young writers is they kind of come out with this attitude. Like, I understand that you have to believe in yourself because trust me, this business is like you get rejected, you know, a thousand times and then you get one person saying yes. So you have to keep your ego, you know. You have to keep your spirits up and your ego right size. But I just see a lot of young writers where they're like, this is the best script, you know, I've ever written and you got to read it. And then if you read it and you start giving them notes, they start arguing with you. And, you know, not that I think that my notes are the end all be all, but it's like there's an unwillingness to 
recognize that they're young. Like, trust me, my first couple of scripts, I went back and read them. I'm like, wow, these are, you know, years later, I'm like, these are crap. You know, these were awful. I can't believe I thought these were great. Um, but you have, I think the biggest mistake young writers make is they don't understand that, you know, it takes, you've got to keep doing it to get better. And, you know, every script that I write hopefully is better than the last script that I wrote because I've learned something in between. So I think being open to that process and realizing it takes time. Like there's a lot of um, people that think there's some easy shortcut. Like, and I'm sure you've heard this too. Every time, you know, I speak at a, you know, any place, whether it's a high school or a college or a horror convention or a screenwriting convention, the two questions that people ask me are, how do I get my script to a studio head? And how do I get financing? How do I get an agent? Yeah. And how do you know, and it's like, there aren't any people think that there are like it, it, it literally, like I heard there was a 10 year rule, somebody, and I can't remember who it was. I wish I could. Somebody very smart and famous at the time had said, you have to be, if you're an artist, you have to be willing to dedicate 10 years of your life to struggling before you finally succeed. And they said, and when we say succeed, we don't mean that you're going to all of a sudden be rich and, you know, have all the money in the world. We mean to get something done. And you know, I thought that rule was bull when I went to, you know, New York as I was 19. I got an agent. I was interning at New Line. I was like, screw that 10-year rule. It was 10 years to the, to the year I graduated high school that I sold Final Destination. So it took all that time of me writing scripts, getting them rejected, almost getting jobs, not getting them. It took 10 years to actually get my first project, like, produced and made for when I graduated. So people have – that's, you know, I think that's a rule that people need to keep in the back of their head because – there's so much clutter in the business where you have people who are like, all right, I'm going to try this acting thing for two years because my dad has a lot of money and I'm pretty and, or handsome. And if I don't make it, I'm going to quit. So you you have like people who are dedicating their lives to this. Plus, you have all this clutter of hundreds of people coming to Hollywood every day, you know, with with rich families. And, you know, they were good look, the best looking person at their school. So they're they've got to be the most beautiful and so you have to out. It's almost like Survivor. You have to like outlast. You know. <laughs> out, 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 what is it? What is it? Outthink, outlast, out. out yeah, it's like <laughs> you gotta, you gotta, you've gotta, you've gotta be in it for the long haul. Like you know, this this isn't a a business. You know, like that you that can be kind of a side hobby. No. You know, it's it's something you really have to like jump into the pool, and you have to like swim in that pool for up to maybe ten years. So there aren't there aren't any shortcuts. You know, because it's even the stuff like when I wrote that letter to Bob Shea, I wasn't I didn't have any grand plan about, oh, this is going to lead to this and this and this in the future. I was just like, I have a story I want to tell. And I want this. He he owns the he does he does the Freddy movies and I want him to read it. You know, like that was my only goal because I had a story to tell that I wanted somebody to read. So um, I could never have planned that. Oh, he's going to kind of take me under his wing and then I'm going to get it. I could I, you know. I never planned any of that stuff. Um, so, so I found that what people call like luck has, has often been years of me working really hard over here and it not paying off like I thought it would. But then somebody else on this side of the room, you know, this side of town reads a script and they're like, oh, let's call Jeffrey. And, you know, so there's been a lot of that. So all the work that you put out there will benefit you somehow, but you just don't always know how it's going to be so you can't expect like a shortcut like somebody at a convention is going to you know have their agent sign you and then all of a sudden you're going to sell your script and then that's it you know it's just it, it's you know it, there is no shortcut i completely agree with you uh, and and i uh, i we both got shrapnel lots of it in our <laughs> business lots of shrapnel lots of wounds yeah. lots of wounds and when you say put work out there you know when i i with this podcast i've been you know, that's why a lot of podcasts fail because they just like, I'm going to do 20. I'm just going to keep do like after 20, they're like, well, no one's listening. I'm not making any money. I got to go. And it's the, I've outlasted yeah. almost all of my contemporaries. And by putting out these episodes, it's amazing who listens to this stuff. Yes. And all of a sudden I get a phone call or I get an email going, Hey, I listened to this one obscure episode and, um, this guy who directed some of the biggest movies ever wants to be on your show because, it'd be a good fit for what he's doing right now. I'm like, I'm like, what? Like, how is that? But that's the thing. It's, it's putting work out there without any attachment to the outcome. I think is, yes. I think the biggest piece of advice. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Now, can you tell me about how you transitioned from just being a lowly screenwriter (laughs) to now being a writer-director of a new film? Well, yeah, it's so funny because, you know, in features, yes, the writers are like, Lowly and TV, not so much, but yes, TV. TV, Yeah, I started. I worked. I worked on. Started working in TV recently. I'm like, I've been missing out on on the party. Like the good stuff is in TV. Oh my god. Um, But you know, it's it's funny. Like I've, I had a couple projects that I that I said I have to direct these because if I give them away, I already know how people are going to change them. And I, these are things I want to direct. And when I first went out with Good Samaritan, um, I just went out with it as a project. I didn't go out with, it, with, you know, with the idea of me directing. But the thing with this story is, um, you know, you, you're not sure if it's a supernatural force that's after them or if it's a killer that's after them or if it's all in the main character's head because she's had some trauma in her past. And every place that wanted to do the movie was like, just make it straight up supernatural or just make it a straight up killer and then we'll do it. And I'm like, but that's not the story I want to tell. Like, that's that's kind of the easy story to tell. Like I want to tell something a little different. So I realized that if I wanted to do this movie the way that I wrote it, then I would have to direct it myself. And I'd been on enough sets um, and been a, have been in the business long enough that I knew the basics. And I directed a short in a, in a, you know, like an indie music video for a friend. So, you know, I knew the, I, I knew the basics, but you definitely don't know what you don't know until you actually get on a set and start <laughs> directing yourself. So you know, that was a little, that was some hubris on my part, um, thinking, well, I've been on a lot of sets and I did a short, so I'm ready. Um, <laughs> That's so, awesome. <laughs> but I have to say it was like such, you know, now that, now that we're done, <laughs> it was, it was such a fulfilling experience and it was such a learning experience too, because now I know the areas that I need to fill in that I didn't know before. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to do it. I'm glad that I did it. It was, you know, again, and my friends always, my director friends were like, well, you, trust me, when you, you direct your first feature, you'll either be like, screw that, I'm never directing again, or you'll want to do it again. So I definitely want to do it again. Um, but yeah, the, re- the reason for me doing it was out of necessity of not wanting them to change, you know, the story into like just a straight up supernatural movie or straight up, you know, slasher movie. Um, and it was, you know, like Final De- I mean, this definitely didn't have anywhere near the budget of Final Destination, but like Final Destination, it was a it was a concept where the people that wanted to do it were like, well, it's not horror supernatural enough to sell it as a horror movie. And if we sell this as a thriller, then you need A-list stars. So we have to get A-list stars attached. So that, you know, that whole, all that business kind of crap that came up with, even with Final Destination, where people weren't, they're like, oh, you can't do something that's not easily put in a box, um, just kind of motivated me to like do it myself. Yeah, because you were you were trying to go down the road with the film like uh, traditionally, like go to the studios, try to get financing, do it a little bit, you know, do it the normal way. But you kept getting so much stuff, uh, so much resistance on your vision. You're like, well, screw it. Let's just go do it indie. Yeah. yeah. And can you talk a little bit about, first of all, the name of the movie, what the name of the movie is and what is it about? Oh, yeah. The movie is called Don't Look Back. Um, it was originally titled Good Samaritan. So people might get confused about that. But it's called Don't Look Back. And it's about um, a group of people who see somebody getting fatally assaulted in a park and they don't help. And one of the people I helped and it get the video goes public. The victim's brother outs the witnesses and somebody or something starts killing them. So our lead character is a woman named Caitlin who's gone through, through some trauma in her past. And she's convinced that something supernatural is after them. So she's trying to solve the mystery of who killed the guy in the park. And everybody else is like, there's a killer after us. And then she kind of ends up popping up at a lot of the <laughs> scenes where the dead people are because she, she's kind of seeing these supernatural signs around her that are pointing her in a, a direction of it's supernatural, but mm-hmm. you're not sure if it's in her head or not. So, um, yeah, that was a bad elevator pitch because I kind of jumped around a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. I'm gonna have to pass on this one. I can't. I can't. I can't. But I can't finance this one, Jeffrey. I'm sorry. Yes, sorry, 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 dude. That was like five, six sentences, and but um, but yeah, it's um, it was it was a really fun film to make, and you know, again, what was great for me too is I I got to I just had a lot of creative control. Like again, there were definitely areas like with locations and things like that where we had to um, you know, compromise because we didn't have a budget to do certain things, but. 
you know, I got to work with a wonderful cast. Um, you know, our lead Courtney Bell is a wonderfully talented black actress. And, you know, I got to find the best actress for the film who was, you know, a, a black actress, which, you know, if I'd done this with a studio, the people that they were throwing at me were, were not, <laughs> they were like, you know, and you know, that's, that's always an important, that's been important for me for so long because I've written diverse cast in my films before, and they always end up being cast with all white actors and actresses. And I just try to explain to people, because again, people, when you talk about diversity, it's again, like certain, you know, hackles start raising because people start getting like defensive, but it's, it's, it's more about, you know, when people read scripts in Hollywood or they cast movies, their default for every character is a white actor or actress. So that's just the default for a, a leading, like we'll send out a casting notice for leading ladies or leading men. And we'll say, you know, all ethnicities and 99% of the submissions will be white actors and actresses. And even if we send out, you know, notes saying we we're looking for black actors and actresses, they'll send us a lot then, but then, you know, they're still throwing in more white people at us being like, look at these people first. So, for certain roles, people of color are just not in people's brains, even the casting people's brains right. um, when it comes to leading roles. And so we're starting to course correct that now, but it is frustrating when they cast like, you know, white actors and actresses in roles that were written for people of color. And they always say, well, we just went with the best person, but I've seen so many, I've been in the, the rooms with casting with people casting projects and their thinking is what is going to be the most palpable to people across the United States and across the world. And that's why they make that decision most of the time. So now we're seeing that course corrected a little bit. Um, and I've just seen so many wonderfully gifted, lead talented actors and actors of, of every race, you know, white, Latino, you know, Asian, black. It's, there's so many talented people that just giving people an opportunity that, you know, like Courtney would not have been cast as a lead in a horror film if it was done by a studio. But I think right. when people see her performance now, they're going to be like, holy shit, who is this girl? Um, so I'm really excited about that. Well, um, I'm, I'm looking forward for it to get to released, and I will put links to all of that in the show notes. I'm going to now ask you a few questions I ask all of my guests. Okay. What are three horror screenplays every screenwriter should read? Um, well, I am going to say A Nightmare on Elm Street. I think that's a really, really strong script. Um, I think the, cause I consider aliens or sci-fi-ish. It, 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 it dances the line of horror. I get you. I get exactly where you're coming from. There's a monster, a predator arguably is, is a monster film. I mean, if you think of monsters of the Frankenstein and Dracula of our generation is aliens and predators. Um, yeah. but they, they dance the line between action, sci-fi, horror. But yes, Aliens, Aliens is just an amazing film, period. And it's, a, it's, a, it's such a great script. And, and that's a script where you can tell a director wrote the script because when you visualize the movie, you visualize exactly what ended up on the screen. So mm -hmm. that's how James wrote that script. Um, but that's probably not a good rule because they always tell screenwriters not to direct in their scripts. <laughs> <laughs> but Alien, the Alien script also was terrifying. Yeah. The original, the original was. Alien was, a, it was terrifying as yeah. well. Um, and what's another great script? I feel like I'm cheating because it's just like I, I just think of Silence of the Lambs too. Like that was another script that I read that, you know, I'm trying to think if, there, if there's obscure horror scripts. Like, you know, the Scream script is is, is really fun. Fantastic. You know? Yeah. Fantastic. Extra, dialogue. Extra, Exorcist obviously is is a good a screenplay. Jaws, I'm not sure if the screenplay is as powerful as the film. I haven't read the Jaws screenplay. Have you read the Jaws screenplay? No. Mm -mm. Yeah, I don't know if that translates, but uh, but I think The Exorcist, if I remember correctly, reading that script, it was pretty terrifying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, uh, what advice would you give a screenwriter wanting to break into the business today? Um, write a lot. <laughs> um, find, uh, you know, reading scripts online, I think finding a genre that you're passionate about is very important because they, again, the business does tend to pigeonhole you or put you in a box based off your first kind of hit. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, you know, if you like horror, if you like sci-fi, if you like action, find some of your favorite movies in that genre and find the scripts online because reading scripts will give you a lot of, you know, 
a lot of inspiration and, and, and you know, even instruction on how to write stuff. So I think that's really important. Um, and I tell people too, it's like, you know, we live in an age now where people can shoot movies like 4k movies on their iPhone. And, you know, the reason you write a script is because you want to get it made. And if you're, I think if you're a young screenwriter, especially, um, surround yourself with good creative people, like find a good friend of yours who's a director, if you're, especially if you're in like school studying screenwriting, you know, like I was talking to Craig Perry at UCLA to like their screenwriting class and Craig asked the class, you know, screenwriters, raise your hands, directors, raise your hands. And he's like, how many of you all hang out together? And none of them did. And Craig's like, guys, you're crazy. Like, you're a writer. You should be hanging out with the directors. You should be hanging out with the writers because you need scripts to write. Um, and so I think people don't think that way when you're when you're younger. It's like you think a little bit more myopically. And I think if you think about that, you know, connecting yourself with a good director, writing a really amazing short, and having a director direct it can get you a lot of attention. Um, you know, I think that that those are the things. Like it's it's continued making sure that you keep growing as a as an artist. Like have friends who will give you honest feedback. You'll you'll find out your friends pretty quickly. You'll have the friends that hate everything you do. Like you don't need those friends to give because they just hate it. They're going to hate everything you do, mm-hmm. and you don't want your mom reading your script because she's going to love everything you write. But you'll find that right balance of people who give you constructive criticism, and it's just be open to that too. Be open to learning more because you're always going to grow as an artist. And what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? What if I haven't learned it completely? <laughs> um, trying to control things that I have no control over um, yeah. is is um, is the lesson of, in life that I still also struggle with. You know, I still try. I try not to, but I think it's a very important lesson is to to you know let go and let God because there are certain things. You know, you can beat your head against the wall for twenty years trying to do something that or or be angry about something that you have no control over and and kind of letting that go as much as possible, I think lets you have a much less stressful life and you can kind of go along with the flow of life. Like when, you know, when the acting thing hit a wall for me, I didn't quit the business. I started writing, you know, so it's kind of going with that flow and seeing what life brings your way, being open to that. Jeffrey, I really appreciate you being on the show. Thank you so much. I want to congratulate you on making the jump from screenwriter to writer director and then in finally getting, I know that's a big step. For, yeah. For, it's, <laughs> it is a big step. It's not done very often. It's definitely not done well very often. So I am, uh, I am, uh, I congratulate you and, and thank you for bringing Final Destination into our, uh, into our world, into the zeitgeist. Uh, it is still very entertaining when I go back and watch those films. Uh, so thank you so much for everything you do, my friend, and uh, continued success. Thank you for all your support. And, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I just, now you got me all like blushy. Um, yeah, <laughs> I just, I do. I appreciate the support. You've, you've been a, a great supporter for so long. So, um, and you know, you know, I've got your back on this side too. Thank you, my friend. I want to thank Jeffrey for coming on the show and dropping the horrific knowledge bombs on the Bulletproof Screenwriting Tribe today. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. Please don't forget to check out his new film, Don't Look Back. And you get links to that and anything else we spoke about in this episode at the show notes at bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash zero ninety. And if you guys haven't checked it out already, please head over to IFH academy.com and check out all of our amazing courses including screenwriting courses how to get money for your film how to produce a film a film distribution blueprint and so many more courses and education to help you guys on your path so thank you again for listening if you are going to go trick-or-treating please please be safe and as always keep on writing no matter what I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast at BulletproofScreenwriting.tv. 